Hello guys, Sue Jarvis speaking. Welcome to LJ Spirit Reacts, episode number um, 813. And today we'll be at to Purple Rose Podcast, episode number 77, Chris Rager. I was meant to say um, um, Dragon Ball Z. If you watch this remix, for you, buddy. Hang on, let me get it. Go ahead and shut the door real quick. And, uh, yeah. So let's react to this beginning in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. Hang on. I'm Terry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now wow. my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Terry Stinson and this is Purple Rose. Tab. Welcome to Purple Rose. My name is Terry Stinson and get ready. We are going to have a blast today. We've got a, a, a good friend, known him for a long time and I'm just thrilled he's here. Mm. Chris Rager, voice actor. He's done a lot of stuff that you know, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Chris, how are you? Well, uh, I am well, sir. How are you, sir? Well, I'm great. I'm glad to have you on the show. Glad to be here. You know, you've been on and done one uh, an episode with Josh. I did. I was, I well, was like, we got to do a full episode here. we got to really get into it. So, well, which is great. I'm not sure I'm that on, on. Yeah. Which is great to see you on. You are that interesting. I've known you for a long time. You're very wow. interesting. Here's here's my cat who is wow. climbing on things right now. <laughs> wow. So, and I know some of this, but I'm going to learn some stuff today, which I always love about it. <coughs> Excuse me. You okay? Uh, actor, comedian, obviously doing the voiceover stuff. You're you're teaching now too, so we're going to get into all that kind of stuff. But how did you start in the entertainment business? Where did it start for you? Well, <laughs> well, you know, I always had memories as a kid of, you know, watching certain shows and this and that and going, I can do that. Well, uh, I could do that, you know, but that's not something truly viable, you know, even at that age. And voiceover for me at a young age was like Mel Blank. That was it. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I had a, a slew of voice actors that I was aware of, you know, Hannah right. Barbera came around, all that stuff. But, so, um, you know, I was always artistic. I always was into music and, and arts and those kinds of things. Wow. Um, and so when I got to the college level, uh, I kind of leaned on that a little bit. I knew I wasn't going to do music. Uh, so I was leaning on the arts. And Come. oddly enough, one semester, I didn't have $16 for a lab fee uh, for my drawing two class. And so... That semester, I took an acting class instead, thinking, oh, that'll be fun. Uh, you know, we can see what that's all about. Well, yeah. I loved it. And on top of that, uh, people were telling me that, hey, you're, you're pretty good at this. You should pursue this, right? So from there, you know, I started to merge myself a little bit more. At some point, I had, was no longer taking, like, basic courses, government, English, those kinds of things. I was just taking... <laughs> Theater classes. Wow. Well, right. Um, I, you know, did a, a what they would call a continuing ed course in improv as well, and really fell in love with that. And again, people were saying, "Hey, you know, Chris is pretty good at this. You should pursue it." And so I continued to do that. Ended up leaving uh, Brookhaven College here in the Dallas County Community College District, of which uh, both of my parents taught in the community college oh, district. I didn't know that. My mom was the, uh, uh, for, for a time, the fine arts director at Brookhaven. And, uh, but mostly taught music theory and piano. Wow. Uh, and so my mom's... And go ahead. What did she think of all this? When you were getting well, into acting? Well, I'll tell you, in my 20s, I wasn't the best communicator with my parents, you know, so... They probably had a general idea of what I was pursuing, wow. but uh, probably didn't take it very seriously. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, 
after college, uh, I had some friends of mine who had gone to an acting school and uh, they came back and were like, Chris, you definitely got to check this out. It's a really great school and, uh, okay. and you really kind of get, oh my God, my cat's just swimming. What's going on? Okay, continue on. Uh, and you can really submerge yourself, you know. And um, I thought, okay, I'll check it out. Uh, it turned out uh, I did like the school and I could get financial aid. And, you know, I signed up. Wow. And, yeah. you know, it was like camera, movement, voice, all this stuff. You know, it was all encompassing in being a performer. And all the teachers were, at, were, were working actors. So I really like wow. that part. I'm not just That's great. taking mm -hmm. a class from some some guy who used to act and now teaches. They were wow. So I okay. like that. Uh, and along the way, I did meet Mr. Josh Martin along with a few wow, others. Wow, which I there we had to be able to proper roles before on these Josh Martin episodes. Continue on. Her, uh, lifelong <laughs> friends. Okay. Who I'm still in the contact with, but. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, that was really it. Uh, graduated from there uh, with Josh and some other guys. Started uh, uh, doing like comedy troops and things like that. You know, we were. Yeah, and I fans. want to talk about that a lot sure. because that to me, I, I mean, I used to go to your shows all the time. And to do improv like that, mm. you know, I know it would it would scare some people. Yeah, I mean, you're literally walking up there in front of a room full of people, asking for ideas. You know, and some of those games that you guys did, and some of these things you did. And I know you have a general idea, but the stuff that you would come up with mm -hmm. is is very impressive. Yeah. And I know some of it is is you know some of it is sketch that you planned out, but a lot of that was improv. Mm -hmm. Where you know where does that come from that you're able to just someone throws something you're able to to run with it. I mean, I don't know where it comes from. I always, I just knew that I really liked doing it. Wow. Um, and okay. I didn't really have a fear of the stage, you know, like some people had stage fright. Me, I was like, right. oh, this, this is awesome. Okay. People are looking at me and laughing and clapping and things like that. That feels good. I'm going to do more of that. You know, so um, I, you know, improv <laughs> always looks a bit more like a magic trick than it really is, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I do like that element of it because I do compare improv to magic sometimes. So that, so that big reveal, that aha moment kind of thing. Wow. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot more preparation that goes into improv than, you know, your layman maybe would understand. You know, I mean, we, we all lived together, too. You know, we were always bouncing ideas off each mm -hmm. other. And, um, you know, quite often we would find ourselves in an improv uh playing through something that we had discussed earlier that day, right? You know, that we had laughed about, played around with, maybe even chosen a character or something. So those moments would happen a lot. Uh, but improv is really about a lot a lot more preparation and understanding of, of the things you sort of go through in your head, the rules of the game, as mm -hmm. it were, um, knowing when to break the rules and bring everyone mm -hmm. sort of with you. Uh, kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, I don't know, man, we were just a, 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 a good group of guys who who made each other laugh. We, we knew each other's wow. timing. We played off of each other, bounced off each other all the time. So, there was a certain element of camaraderie behind the scenes in those in those years that took place that um, yeah. I don't know, we probably took for granted. <laughs> well, when, when do you know, because I'm curious to this, you know, let's say mm -hmm. when you're doing one of these improv games, mm -hmm. when do you when do you take an idea or you, you take something and you run with it and you can kind of tell the audience is laughing and so you keep going or when do you throw it back and kind of get out? Do you know what I'm saying? You sometimes yeah, you are you are sort of in those wow. moments, you know, based on where you are at in say the game or the rules of the scene you're in. Right. Uh, wow. you do sort of gauge that, but you are always looking for that out, that sort of blackout moment where you get the big laugh and you can go on to the next thing. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I always like to make sure that we've uh, uh, checked off the list of what, what rules we needed to, 
uh, what things we needed to cover. You know, I mean, we always used to do this improv uh, called What Are You Returning, right? It's very Tom. generic. Every improviser has played What Are You Returning, right? Okay. Uh, we changed, picked it up a little bit by making it something the audience would choose. It's made out of something it wouldn't be normally made out of. You know, and that a famous person has given it to you as a gift. Okay, but that's these three things, right? Right. Tom? And, uh, you know, I could always, and then you wanted to kind of do them in order so you don't then confuse the, the guy having to guess, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there was always, a, I mean, just a certain amount of familiarity with my friends and those guys that mm -hmm. um, want. Hold on. Before I pause, before I continue. We lost uh, Alex Jones, lives of Sandy Hook victims of um, regenerative settlement efforts of, um, okay. Yeah, I felt worried about this, but, you know, it's not his loss of Alex Jones, Sandy Hook victims. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I saw it. Uh, it was a news report from the. Uh, the voice of Dr. Dragon himself, John uh, DiMaggio. And I felt worried for this guy. Continue you on. I knew that they were trying to be vague on purpose. Right. right as to screw with me. <laughs> right. Right? Wow. So I knew when that was happening. And, you know, in some ways they almost had to do that because we did know each other so well that it would, it would look like we had talked about it backstage or something because I would... Right. Wow. I would get it, right? So they had to had to at least make it kind of hard on me because our our understanding of each other uh, mm -hmm. went 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 so well that uh, I'd be like, oh, it's this. Or I would if I did guess it, I would have to maybe hold on to it a little bit longer uh, to make it look like I don't know. So uh, you know, that well, just I, comes with time and experience with your friends. Mm -hmm. and well, and I, I I'm curious, do you um are there times where you can tell you're you're kind of drowning, but you're oh, determined sure. you're determined to turn turn that into a laugh to turn. Well, I think I think at certain point in a game like that, I definitely would eventually at some wow. point break that fourth wall and let the audience know that I had no idea. Wow! Right, and that that and that that I have gotten so much information, it's not very all convoluted, and I need to kind of like restart in a way. Uh, I mean, we definitely, that was one of our more well-known games, and partly because they would screw with me. Uh, the audience did enjoy that. Uh, but yeah, we probably had, you know, that game is probably supposed to take maybe, you know, five at the most ten minutes, and we we had 20 minute, what are your returnings? Wow. You know, <laughs> yeah. Literally. And uh, one person laughed my, um, my um, let's say, run for his run thing. Who's laughing at that? Anyway. Why does Alex for you by uh let's see you know which yeah it was it was Alex I don't know he's watching this episode but which react we'll just see what happens continue on laughing at my misery of not knowing what to do with things but is your mindset when you go into that well I got to complete the game or at least that's the goal yes but I also got to get some laughs right I mean that's sure you're in a comedy troupe. <laughs> Sure. Well, yeah, and you would do that too. Like if you had guessed it, you'd try to find a clever way of letting you know the audience know and your players know that I have this and uh, that I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to go down this road of this story uh, to let you know that I have. So everyone's sort of like, oh, okay, Chris knows it. Mm -hmm. You know, we can move on to the next one. Wow. So all of this mm -hmm. obviously is prepared into what you're doing now. Um, all the voice acting. Uh, Dragon Ball Z, which I, you know, I know how popular that is. I know how much people love that. Had you done any voiceover acting prior, other than just school? Because you've got one of those voices that it commands attention. Like you had, I mean, this is the same thing you were doing back in uh, Section Eight. Well, I guess in some ways, if it were up to like my voice teacher, uh, hmm. I was. You know, she would always tell me my voice was born for the theater, you know. Wow. Uh, and I loved doing plays and theater and whatnot, but, you know, I knew as a as an actor, I wanted to make money and right. be an actor, you know, and have a, a, you know, 
pay bills and things. So I knew theater maybe not be number one unless I was willing to move and go somewhere. I really wasn't. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, and you know, the mission was never to come out and be a voice actor per se. Uh, but yeah, no, Dragon Ball was my first ever voice acting job as a playing a character. Wow. Um, with without filming me, you know, I've done some commercials and uh, very low budget films and things like that. But uh, mm -hmm. um, when Dragon Ball came along. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like an opportunity for actors in Dallas to uh, wow. well have just a little bit of consistency that we could get paid at something more regularly. And, uh, and so that was very exciting. So yeah, when an opportunity like that came along, we we all jumped at it. Mm -hmm. and, and how is that when you go into that? You see this opportunity. You're, you're auditioning for something that you could see that has the potential of being very successful. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea what any kind of success would Dragon Ball bring of any sort. Right. You know, it was wow. we're it's a cartoon and we're paying money. <laughs> you know, that's wow. and you know, I mean I'd certainly heard of the anime, you know, but mm -hmm. um we didn't at the time mm -hmm. I didn't call it that. You know, for me it was still like Japanimation from wow. when I was a kid we watched Speed Racer, things like that. Right. Um, and, uh, so the idea of anime was a little new to me, but I definitely knew what I was getting into. I knew it was a Japanese animation mm -hmm. and you would be dubbing the voices. So I got that. I understood that. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, um, we didn't have like we do now, the Japanese voices to listen to, right? So we were just kind of flying by the seat mm -hmm. of our pants. So I didn't have a reference mm -hmm. of the Japanese or anyone. Wow. Uh, reference of uh, what that voice might sound like or could sound like you know it was 1999 uh, wow. the internet was not as good as it is today so looking up or finding out you know i mean mike the only reason i knew about it is because mike mcfarland plays master roshi a long time director and voice actor out of fun rachel yeah for some reason i thought you said step mcfarland for family guy could do you on and he, was uh, with you in Section 8. Yes, was with, with us in Section 8. Wow. And he was like, hey, guys, I uh, um, I booked a part in this uh, cartoon. And these guys out in Fort Worth, they need more actors. You guys should go audition. I was like, yeah, I'll go. And yeah. They gave a part to you. God knows I can do a part. You know? <laughs> wow. Uh, well, I mean, honestly, it was for me. It was like Mike had booked a part doing this voice that I had heard him do a thousand times, right? So for me, wow. it was a very familiar voice. I'm like, they gave you money to do that voice? Well, wow. Geez, I I can do that. <laughs> you know? Wow. Uh, and so, not a knock on Mike. I was just, you know, right. it's it it seemed um, um, more real. Like, oh, I could totally get something like that. You know. So um, I went and auditioned. Uh, Mr. Satan Hercule was on the docket that day, and he looked, uh, I mean, often when I'm thinking of a voice for something, you know, I'm looking for my own experience, my own history wow. and knowing of things I've seen, been through mm -hmm. pop culture, family, friends, otherwise, and Mr. Satan looked very much like Hulk Hogan to me, and I couldn't get it out of my head, Wow. and so that being sort of the baseline, I just sort of, I went with that kind of voice. No. Well, well, you know, I think it's really important what you were just saying about with Mike and that you could get that job. I, I think that's where all the your experience comes in, right? You know, if you're um, new in this business, right? It's an audition. I'm scared of this and that, but you're like, I've been doing improv. I <laughs> bet. I mean, it's just way. Yeah. yeah, and you heard train in the background. Please ignore that. Continue on. Yeah, like I thought, I thought to myself, look, I know Mike. I know Mike's experience level. I know, you know, uh, how and why he makes me laugh when we do this comedy show together. And I thought to myself, yeah, my, I'm no different than Mike. Wow. You know, and so I got a legitimate shot of, you know, getting paid to do cartoon voices, which sounded great. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, I, I never thought right. of, like making this a thing, but mm -hmm. I would love to do it for sure. I was going to say, don't you think that that confidence is, is important? 
not that you, you know, I'm going to go nail this and I definitely got this. Right. You go into mm-hmm. something going, I, I know I can do this. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, it definitely helped. You know, I mean, I had uh, years of proven experience and entertaining people and uh, working on different projects and, you know, having a plethora of impressions and character voices that I created on my own. And, oh. you know, shoot, man, I, in an improv or a scene, mm-hmm. I, over, over my history of my life, I've done the voice of Hulk Hogan you know, um, too many times to count. Right. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was nice to be able to draw upon that experience uh, of, of years of playing around and, you know, my mom saying no amount of cartoons or video games is ever going to amount to anything wow. kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, she was like, well, turns out she was wrong. <laughs> and, uh, wow. It can amount to something. And uh, now I don't look like the, I don't look like the stupid, lazy kid who uh, who didn't really want to go to college. Wow. <laughs> Does, uh, what is the audition process like for something like that? Are you actually, do they even care about you being able to dub and do the, the actual job? Or is it more about finding the voice and seeing it? Yeah, I, at the time, it just, it seemed more about, you know, could I do a voice they enjoy? Uh, I definitely didn't audition with any ADR or anything like oh, that. Um, I was just called and told that I got the part, and uh, the ADR stuff was kind of learned on the fly. But you know, look, it, at the end of the day, it's not rocket surgery. You know, it's 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 actually about things I've been trained. To- uh, before I continue on, please give a shout out to National Doctors Day um, to get fans and to get patients. Mom, if you watch this episode of LGBTs right now, I mean you're a materials manager, but this is for people at doctors at FM Health System. Your job, you know. I, I when I heard about this, I'm like, okay, this is very happiness right there. So, for all of us at my my former job at FM Health System, you please to give you a happy faces right there. And just now, I just post. I saw his notification recently and say that you're a top fan badge as one of the WTLC TV's most cage followers. I'm like, why even bother? You know, just uh, think about the, think about the, uh, become a number one. I'm not. WTLC is supposed to be a PBS have affiliate. Two, I'm a huge fan of PBS. You know. For one and two, it's not by CBS anymore because that's just me. And three, I am at the time, yes, they need to share affiliates with CBS and PBS at the same time. You know, that's just me. Continue on what you're saying, um, Chris. Move on. Do over years of improv and acting lessons um, was to, to listen. Uh, also musically, you know, like I told you, I was a, a grew up a musician, played several different instruments, and uh, being able to kind of have that rhythm, that timing of things, you know, that uh, already existed in me through mm-hmm. through performing and doing music and stuff, you know, I found it like, oh, okay. all the things I need to be good at this, I've got tons of experience at. So it didn't, it didn't. It was never a daunting process to me. It was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> you know? So the learning curve was pretty easy for you. I think so. You know, and back then we had to be really good. Like today, mm. everything's digital, you know, so mm. things can be moved and slid and compressed. Mm. But back then we were literally recording on beta tape. And wow. Click and whir and spin around wow. and go through the computer. I mean, it was a thing. Right. <laughs> right. And so back then we had to be much better at starting and stopping on time and these days uh you don't have to be uh Uh, you can start a little late but just make sure that you're not having to you can start a little early you start a little late just make sure you're not slowing down or speeding up to make up for time you think you've lost Mm -hmm. because pro tools is an amazing thing and kind of set that where it needs to go and uh, without distorting it sometimes be able to stretch and compress it the line a little bit just to make it fit a little better and if the director likes to read, boom, you're on to the next line. 
Yeah, and I was going to ask that. Does it help you with the creative process now, being digital like that, that you don't have to worry as much about being so exact? Uh, I don't know. Part of me likes it old school. Um, mm. You know, any actor uh, likes to critique themselves and does mm. it pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that relationship you have with the director and whatnot, you always want to make sure you're not stepping on their toes, but you know, listening to what they have to say, I'll usually make it known with like a little noise or something that I'm not happy with that read. You know, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll give a little hint or, you know, or mm. something like that. But just so to kind of let it be known that if you liked it, that's cool. I did not. <laughs> you know? um, but uh, again, that's about, you know, sort of time and experience and relationships with those, with those people, the directors and engineers and stuff. And, um, yeah. but it really is, it's, it's about listening and timing and, um, being able to kind of watch, I mean, it's all right there in front of you. You got a script, you got the anime yeah. in front of you. I mean, it's not like it's a mystery. It's right, right there, you know, <laughs> play what's on the screen, right? It's drawn a certain way to give a certain reaction or thought or thing, you know, yeah. and, uh, um, Play what's on the screen. That's what I tell people. It's right there for you. I and improv. I, I had to make that shit up. Or excuse me. You know, <laughs> wow. I had to make that yeah. up. Right? I go in anime. It's right there. Makes it much easier. Excuse me, but is there the challenge? Because we talked a little bit this the last time you were on about having to make the noises. Wow. If, if there's, if you can tell the character to a grunt or a this or a that. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, those things, freedom to, to play. Those things are written into the script a little bit, somewhat yeah. not. And if you do have a, maybe a little time to throw in a, a this or that, you know, it's more than acceptable as long as you're not changing the meaning of anything. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I I always chuck uh, those grunts and things and screams and all that stuff to uh, uh, very much childhood play spaces, right? Can. You know, those moments as a kid where you would spin around and, oh, or play out, go play, you know, war wow. with your friends. My friends and I play war all the time. I think about it now, like, why did we play war? You know, but wow, okay. it seems so violent. But, you know, that's what we were doing. You know, go, 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 machine gun and go, oh. <laughs> Yeah, that gun stuff. Man, like to you on. You know, so uh, in a way, <laughs> again, I look at it like, I, oh, and by the way, I did saw this on. Let me see if Chris Rager can. Okay, he's on episode four. I did talk about this in last episode of the 2010s episode about the reads, you know, which is episode four and two. And uh, yeah, it was great fun. So um, yeah, we did react to him on episode four and two. So um, yeah, he said earlier in the episode, which is the full interview of Chris Rager. I um, said that. Um, he said that, well, you're getting shit going on. Do, do, do. Well, so, um, this is it. I want to talk about it on this full episode. This is like over air four plus episodes later. Continue on. That was training in some way to kind of go back to that place where you do try to give a realistic death noise, you know, because you were having fun. Right, and well, the more realistic sounding, the more fun it was. Wow! Well, right, unless you're like, no, you missed me, you didn't get me. Right. No, I saw you. You're like, no, you didn't. I'm fine. You know, you always have those mm -hmm. moments. But so now, how many different characters have you? Because I know you've done video games and you've done. A, how many different ones have you done to this point? Um, you don't have to give me an exact number, but I don't know, man. If you look at my IMDb <laughs> page, it's over. It's over 250. Wow. So how do you keep them all together? That's where I want to go with this. How do well, you a lot of them all together? A lot of them are only around for a little bit and die. And so I don't have to ever do wow. them again. Wow. So I don't really have to remember that voice. But uh, what are you doing, Cat? Um, <laughs> wow. Wow. But these days, I mean, they'll definitely, if it's something I, I play more regularly or maybe there's been a gap in between. Playing a character over a season or something like that. Um, yeah. 
they're always really good at being able to sort of play it, play it for you again. And so you're like, oh yeah, okay, I remember where there's a little shift in uh, what I did mm. to uh, achieve that sound or whatever. Um, so and that's so that's you know they show you. They're like, here's you in this other episode. That's what you sounded like. You got it. And you're like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Is it is it hard to keep them? You know, how do I make this one a little bit different than than this one and that one? I mean, when you're doing so many like that, well, is it a challenge? I I in that regard, I sort of uh, give credit to the to the animators and the artists themselves. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my own workshops that I teach, I have a portion of the class where we look over anime sides, like audition sides for anime, and we look at the characters and how they're drawn. Wow, okay. And what can you gather just from that? You know, how old they are, where they maybe sit uh, socially amongst their peers, you know, are they grunt, are they, you know, one of the cool guys, or... Um, and, you know, begin to uh, look at their place in the world and say, okay, well, what kind of voice might fit that kind of character? Mm-hmm. And, um, I see. You know, so like I said, for Mr. Satan, it was Hulk Hogan. He had a championship <laughs> belt on and a, and a Hogan stash. I mean, minus the blonde hair wow. and the bald head, it was Hulk Hogan. And, and, wow. and, 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 and in that moment, I thought the, the artist, the Japanese artist, Obviously, did that on purpose. Wow. Right? Uh, but apparently, they didn't. Or, you know, there's been lots of interviews, but I, I think I think they're making it up. He was clearly <laughs> based. He was clearly based on Western wrestling, and uh, uh, although they do not, <laughs> they do. I don't know why. But uh, so wow. yeah, Hulk Hogan. I mean, I played Mr. Korg in a Borderlands uh, a video game series. Um, they hadn't even drawn the character when I auditioned. The artist wow. wasn't finished. And so in the audition side, it was a picture of Randy Macho Man Savage. And I thought, I, so I can do him. I've been doing him for years. I even incorporated some of him into Mr. Satan's voice. Okay. You know, and so, you know, sometimes a part presents, it, uh, presents itself and you're like, I got this. I don't, I don't know anyone else in this industry at this time who can do that voice, right? Yeah. And uh, so might as well be me. <laughs> um, so it's, it's fascinating. And, and I love this because I know some of the – we get a lot of people that watch this show that want to get into the industry, been in all of this. And there's a confidence. You get to that point where you – I got this. Right, and I know people are listening to this going, "Well, how do you get to that point where you just go, I got yeah. this?" Well, um, acting, playing characters, I should say, you've always got a bit of bring a bit of yourself, you know, mm-hmm. um, and you, you kind of maybe uh, you need to maybe more understand what exactly mm-hmm. your strengths are, and what matches up, what fits, you know. So look, I don't go around trying to play like younger, prettier characters because wow. I know so many actors who can do that voice naturally, right? Where I've got to play mm. it or tweak it. It comes off a little false, right? Wow. So, you know, you just got to understand where you sort of sit in that world and what types of characters are going to work best for you. And, um, and hopefully along the way, some of them hit, you know? That's not for everybody, and sometimes they don't hit. Mm-hmm. You know, there's yeah. plenty of people who are going to try to get into this business and not have the wealth of experience that I went through, you know, from the ages of, well, I don't know, 10 mm-hmm. to, you know, 25 when I went through acting school. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and sort of sometimes wake up one day and go, oh, I want to be a voice actor because. Well, my friends like wow. my voice, and you know I can do some funny characters. It makes my friends laugh and stuff like that. Yeah, but um, have you put those thoughts and feelings to the test in front of hundreds of people on a on a stage? Wow, because that's a whole different beast altogether. And having gone through that gives me a better idea of what I need to do vocally 
when I'm in the booth, you know, because mm. on stage, vocally, it's out here. You know? yeah. On a TV set or a film, you know, it gets, it, it gets brought in a little bit more, you know. Right. So you've got to be able to play, use your voice appropriately. And then, the, and then yeah. in voiceover, you know, it comes into this you know, circle. And again, you know, an understanding of what you can do vocally and um, uh, being able to still kind of understand that you're not just in front of you're not just a talking head. You're you're an actor. You're you're moving. You're expressing. There's the um, physicalization of those moments that are taking place right before you in an anime scene. Well, you know, not necessarily in video games. You kind of use your imagination in those moments. But um, wow, yeah. Did I answer your question? You did. You did. I want to go a little bit different direction here, and I want to talk about the conventions. Uh, it's such a fascinating how that has blown up. Um, right. You know, mm -hmm. from from uh, uh, what was it? San Diego is basically the only one doing it at one point, right? To wow. every town is doing one now, and the amount of people that come out and the fan base is is amazing. Wow. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, when I first started looking at conventions and trying to book some uh, on my own. Uh, I had just been through an accident. I was just kind of back on my feet again. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for other ways to bring in income. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Chris Savage told me, he's like, you should book at conventions, man. You're in Dragon Ball Z. Wow. And they'll, all, they'll take you. You're in Dragon Ball. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's a foregone conclusion. And, you know, I did have a little bit of success in that world, you know, but mm. um, I also hadn't played any, like, super big lead characters in any anime, and it seemed that that was sort of like what my competition was. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, as that progressed, conventions began to progress. Like, it got to a point, at least, I was strictly doing, like, anime conventions, right? Wow. Because there got to a point that there was, and probably still is, I mean, after, you know, post-pandemic things, hopefully are picking back up, but there was... Right. Yeah, which is now called the endemic now. Do you want? Every weekend of any week throughout the year, there was an anime convention happening. Okay. Right? And not like, you know, one here, one there. It was multiple. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Okay. And, um, you know, and so that, that whole idea and world began to grow, and, you know, you want to you know, do what you can to kind of be a part of that. Yeah. And then Dragon Ball came back all of a sudden, right? Wow. So redubbing Dragon Ball again and Dragon Ball Z Kai. Uh, there was more video games and stuff, you know, and that kept driving the popularity. Then they had a couple of movies, you know, and um, just the convention scenes continued to grow and grow. And once we sort of got intermingled into what I just call pop culture cons, which kind of has a smattering from, from anime to the office. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, involved with those, I really hadn't done any just specifically anime conventions, but I've done a whole lot of them, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Because there is this crossover world with Dragon Ball, of all things, and uh, you know, I look back and think, and thank God Mike said something. <laughs> wow. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the idea, I mean, I remember I first signed an autograph for Dragon Ball when Score Entertainment, you know, makes baseball cards and everything. They made a card game, a card game, card trading card series for Dragon Ball. Mm -hmm. And I got called in to do a, a batch signing of some of the first cards out. Wow. And they were going to pay me this much money or whatever, right? And I, and I was sort of like, say what? <laughs> like, yeah, man, we'll give you like, you know, this many hundreds of dollars to come in and sign these things. Wow. Okay. I was like, and that's it? <laughs> wow. Yes. Okay. So, you know, I made like a, a few hundred bucks for signing these cards. And then they started doing this uh, Dragon Ball Z Hummer tour where they uh -huh. guy would drag, drive this actual military grade black Hummer with Dragon Ball Z decals all over it. It's really cool. 
he would drive that around the country and they would fly in the voice actors mm-hmm. to do you know promotions for the tournament and sign stuff for everyone and they mm-hmm. pay you money yeah and, uh, okay. you know that just became they became like a became, became a thing you know and i was always like wow that beats waiting tables or <laughs> the other bartending or anything wow. else i did so wow well, yeah, I feel incredibly lucky uh, and uh, however you want to say it, blessed, whatever it is, yeah. to, uh, to be able to make part of my income uh, is signing my name. It's crazy. It's it's just like, wow, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> it, is, it is cool, but the reaction, I've been there at a couple of them and, and seen it. I mean, the, the fans go crazy. To wow. meet you and want to ask you questions and get you to sign all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I mean, no, the fans are great. They really are. You know, they always, always very complimentary. You know, something mm-hmm. uh, Josh and I hear all the time. I'm sure the other actors do too. Is, uh, man, you were you were my childhood. It was, you know, mm-hmm. I grew up listening to you. And it's like, well, you, know, you were my wow. adulthood. Thank you for helping me pay my bills. <laughs> Wow. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people do. I mean, uh, this happens fairly regularly. You know, Dragon Ball Z saved my life, you know, and this is why. And so you're always wow. like, you always feel really, you know, lucky and blessed to be, have been a part of it. Yeah. And it affected so many people's lives and, and you know, ultimately was uh, very positive ways. Yeah. So. I mean, but what is that like when someone tells you, I mean, Hearing this whole story and how you've gotten into this, and it's it's obviously it's it's your passion, but it's also a job. And next thing you know, you're finding out that what you did helped someone's life, and then it's that that big. Obviously, I saw it with Barney. I, I went through sure. that a lot with Barney. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have a perspective with it. But what is your perspective on that when someone tells you a story like that? Well, it's just you know. Uh it's a heartwarming, heartfelt moment, you know, mm-hmm. like, wow. Like, um, and you try to just be graceful about it, you know, like this, you know, this person obviously went to, through something that was hard for them, traumatic for them, uh, upsetting, you know, whatever it was. And, you know, the, in that moment, somebody feels like sharing something like that with you and wants to be, yeah. open in such a way is I think uh, just trying to be uh, accepting and graceful in that moment so it's, a, it's the best way I can describe it because I know that's what I think you know because in some yeah. ways it's it's true it's it can be a little uncomfortable right you know wow because you're like oh man I didn't know we were gonna go here but you know that was where you style viewers versus the vibe ladies and gentlemen continue on Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And I'm very glad you watched, you know, it, right. it affected you in this way. So, wow. Just happy to have been a part of that in, in whatever capacity that was. So. What other questions do they, they ask? Do they want to know? Do you get questions about how to get in the business? Do you get questions about oh, what, yeah. what it's like to do it? And then what are the questions they ask you? No, I mean, everyone, yeah, wants to know how I became a voice actor, you know, and, you know, I, and they ask in a variety of different ways, you know, there's, there's one, there's the one way that people ask you, like, oh, wow, how'd you get into that? Like, I could totally do that. What, like, how, what do you do? Because I would love to do that, mm-hmm. you know, which is, you know, mildly insulting mm-hmm. that just anyone can do it. Wow, you know, and uh, you know, not have the uh, you know the experience and education to fully understand, you know, what got me here. Plus, in the in the in the end, you know, there's got to be some natural ability already. You know, you've wow, already right. Got to have, got to have. You always have to already be slanting uh, in that sort of idea or direction in some way. Uh, not that it can't be learned, because it can. Mm-hmm. Just typically, that's you know what I see when people mm-hmm. kind of go down that path. Yeah. Um, well, isn't that part with you know where we are today with social media and YouTube and all those things? 
that they see all that kind of stuff and go, oh, yeah, I can, I can do that. Well, and, I encourage, that and I encourage people to go down that road, you know, because that's, that's how I looked at it when I was young. But again, I was young. You know, if you're 31 and you don't like your job and you have no acting experience whatsoever, wow. and you go, oh, I should maybe look, up, look into that. Well, maybe you should. And I encourage you to, you know, to uh, look into uh, things you feel like you might may enjoy or may be good at. Wow. You know, but, uh, you know, don't go into the notion that you're not years behind uh, the talent that is currently booking work in this industry, you know. And uh, the years of experience of, of, going through that of mm. usually in the beginning, you know, falling on your face and, you know, feeling stupid and feel, you know, you mature a little bit into, you know, being able to understand what it is to be a performer, to have feelings, you know, to express those feelings, to uh, the thought process that goes to take you to those feelings, those physicalities and breath, you know, breath is number one in mm -hmm. any actor's tool belt because what the breath can do is it can take you there when you have emotions usually our breath changes in some way mm -hmm. being able to understand how it changes and to be able to use those uh use that knowledge to uh invoke emotions that you maybe aren't currently feeling mm -hmm. you know but through breath and then through your imagination can can get there I went on a tangent about breath, but no, 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 question. no. I no, no you did. No, no. I think that's I think that's great. Okay. Now my Carrie's part, my for Chris's part, but it is for Carrie's part at least. Continue on. How do you tell teach them the other part, which is you may not get a paycheck for a while? I, I think that's such a an interesting aspect because you'll hear it, you know, you it doesn't really matter who the actor is. There's a point where you have right. it, you're thin for a while and what keeps you going to go i'm going to make this and and i'm still going to figure out how to pay my bills you know again if you really want to get in this business i really hope you're young right wow because it, it takes a little bit you know and, okay um and as you kind of go through kind of achieving the level of quality you want as a performer Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, you find yourself maybe doing certain things for free along the way. Okay. You know, but as you get better and people are willing to pay you money, you know, really understand what your worth, mm -hmm. what your worth is. And okay. realize that at some point it's going to be okay to turn down those things who are still asking for you to do what you do for free. Okay. Um, and um, eventually... You're, you're only working for money, you know, for right. things that will pay you money. But, you know, in the beginning, sure, it's it's okay to do certain things for free along the way, whether it's you know, indie voiceover work and stuff like that to gain that experience. Mm -hmm. But in the end, when you achieve a certain quality you, you and and people are willing to pay you money for it, you, know, mm -hmm. you got to really understand what your value is and let the free stuff go. <laughs> We've wow. all had to let those free stuff, free right. stuff go. Mm -hmm. So, what brings you full circle to now you're teaching? Well, um, I never. I mean, I've always dabbled in it, whether you know, instructing or teaching. Um, maybe not improv itself, but like an improv game or something like that. I never. Um, I never really thought about doing that, but if I was, it would probably have been improv work because I had so much experience with it. But okay. Now, after years of being a voice actor, uh, when I look back on how I gained experience, it was by doing, right? Okay. Getting up and doing it. And yeah, sure, observing others around me who were doing it and saying, oh, I may do that differently. I may make a different choice. You know, mm. uh, it definitely helps you gain experience. But, uh, um, at a certain point, I I came up with an idea because of others that I heard uh, teaching this this mm -hmm. process we go through ADR and 
and, and things like that. I, I wanted to expand that a little bit with some video games and stuff because, you know, I, I was known for uh, some fun characters in video games and wanted to go to kind of express that idea. Wow. And um, so along the way, I came up with an idea of really not an acting class, but a doing class, you know, uh, right. doing what it is we do, whether it's through the audition process, whether it's working with the time code and the scripts mm -hmm. and doing the ADR and the audio digital replacement, you know, putting our voices in the flaps and uh, working with different directors and, uh, and the like, uh, and also having a community around you uh, to kind of help build out from, because again, nobody really makes it in this business alone. Mm -hmm. It's usually, you know, uh, a pack or a den of friends that, uh, mm. you know, kind of collaborate with one another yeah. and uh, kind of help motivate each other along the way. But mm -hmm. um, where was I going with this? I'm losing train. No, just talking about teaching and how you got into it. Yeah. So making that decision. So from there, I thought it'd be a really good idea to, uh, to help students out there who wanted to know about what it is that we do actually putting them through the steps that we do and along the way giving them notes and critiques and, and direction and help along the way um so you know i do have a kind of a, a specific ask of the students in my class before a class starts is that they have some performance experience of some kind you know or that you know they can at least show me and express to me that this is something that they're really going to continue on with and uh, sort of go down that path of, you know, being a performer, being an actor. You know. so. What are the things that the students struggle with the most? Um, I would say I have a lot of good students actually that come through. So not all of them struggle with this, but the ones who maybe have a little less experience, uh, struggle with the idea of, mm. that I need to make a voice wow. for this. This is a voice I need to make, and I think that voice sounds like this. When that tells me you don't have a full understanding of the character, because the character will tell you who their voice, what their voice is, right? By who they are, who they react with, how they react with others. Um, and, uh, uh, and now in anime, Literally, the Japanese are always a great reference of where to kind of begin in that too, because you hear it, right? You want to mm -hmm. you want to use as many influences as you can, especially ones that are coming from the, you know, original uh, show, right? right. Um, so yeah, did I answer that? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And how long does it take you to get it? That's kind of where I'm going with this. So. Do you just, are you able to see the character pretty quickly and go, I, I got where that is? And is that just experience? And for them, is that part of really what you have to learn? It's not the voice as much as just understanding. Yeah. I mean, I, I give a lot of credit to the improv experience I have when it comes to doing that, because that is something you have to do a lot. Yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, yeah. Quite often you're going into a booth that you don't know what character you're playing that day. You've never seen a script. And the director's like, here this person is, here's who they are, and whenever you're ready. <laughs> wow. And so, yeah, you do have to make some quick quick choices. You have to commit to those choices, you know, and uh, commit to the idea of following them through their experiences, you know. Yeah. Um, Excuse but me. again, I, you know, I take in that information. I listen to what the Japanese are doing. And so I can make a better informed uh, you know, idea of a, a choice, not a mm. voice, right? I tell my students that a lot. We make choices, not voices. Okay. Right. I choose, I choose to play in that arena of my body with the with this voice because uh, because of what I know, not because I want it. I want to make it fit. Okay. Right. Right. I keep going back to, and I'm hearing it through this whole interview. There's a fearlessness, which it sounds like you probably already had some of it in you, but then obviously from improv, 
and being on stage because, and I get what you're saying, but when, you know, when a director says, okay, here's this, 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 go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes it's easier said than than done and and you're going to, people are going to overthink it. They're going to do a lot of things. I think that comes down to being willing to fail. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm more than happy to go in there and make my choice and for everyone to hate it. Wow. That's fine. Give, wow. Me, give me more information and I'll make a different choice. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, and I think the more often you do that, the better you get at making the right choices. Because mm-hmm. uh, you're more informed and, you know, asking the right questions, too. You know, mm-hmm. I want to make sure that I fully know, like, who am I talking to and, and who are these people and why are they important to me? You know, because mm-hmm. that's going to make give me more, more well informed as how the character may be may react to them, good or bad. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, so yeah, it's a. Uh, I say it's a quick process. You know, hey, here this person is. They're ready, ready to go. Uh, there's plenty of time to ask questions and fully understand what you're about to get into. Um, you know, and after you watch it, you know, watch it again. You know, if you have any questions or think thinking that I uh, don't fully have, you know, the choice I want to make here yet. You know, ask questions, ask the director, um, wow. and listen, listen to the anime, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, be willing to make the wrong choice. I think that's really important, and that advice is really important. That if if you because that can be in an audition, right? The, the same, where you're, sure, you're you're making a shot at it, and you may not give it get the role for whatever reason, but yeah, you at home you auditions, committed and went. At home auditions are a little more hard these days, I think. You know, from wow. back in the day when you had in person auditions, you had people around, you were, you know, seen by the director, you could talk to them, you could ask them questions, those kinds of things. And you still find moments and opportunities for that, but they're uh, much fewer and further between than kind of like stuck at home. Here's this character. Here are the sides. And now you don't have anyone to talk to about it, (laughs) you know? So I always recommend for people like, hey, find you. Yeah, I'll talk more about FW, talk about more about an FWO, but welcome to the Wild Coast star, Bruce Willis, now sees. Stepping away from acting. Yeah, I'll talk more about it after the L. Uh, Continue on. Uh, an audition buddy. You know, find somebody you can who knows you and you can bounce ideas off of, and someone who's not afraid to say, "Man, that sucked." You know? Wow. I think that's great advice. I actually haven't heard that before. I think that's great advice because you're right. The way it's changed, and you know, you get up out of your PJ or do it in your PJs. <laughs> and and you don't know. You right. Don't know. I mean, it's much different than you know making yourself presentable to go somewhere and see the familiar faces you knew you were going to see. You know because you knew the other actors in town who wow. who were called in for the similar roles that you were going in for. I mean, me, I was always known as one of the improv guys. You know, there were always the improv guys always got called in uh, for certain things. Things I always said, ah. Oh, they don't have a script. <laughs> That's why they want the improv guys, because they want us to make their script better. Right? Wow. Uh, but, um, and is that, yeah. is that hard? You mentioned that. Is that hard because the, the Japanese, I mean, it's already there. So you can't really improvise. Is that hard for an improvised actor? No, to- it's not. It's not. Uh, you know, Im- improv- improvising it has a lot of structure to it, <laughs> you know? Huh? Uh, that uh, the audience is unaware of, you know, so the, mm-hmm. you know, the man behind the curtain or the, you know, is this your card kind of moment. But uh, um, I think um, I find little ways here and there, especially mm-hmm. if it's a character like Hercule, Mr. Satan from Dragon Ball. Anytime I go in to record for that, based on what's written Jeez. there, I have a little bit of freedom. Because the director knows that I know this character better than the writer does. Yeah. And will even ask me, is that something you think Mr. Satan would say? Or, 
you want to add a little something, you want to change mm -hmm. that, you know, based on what you know your flaps available are. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of the times I will change it, you know, mm -hmm. or just because I think, you know, this is funnier. As long as it doesn't change the meaning of what's the context of what's going on within the scene. Uh, but for things like that, a character that you've been playing for years, uh, are you're, at least with this director, I'm afforded a certain amount of flexibility. Wow. Which is, which is awesome when you can be yeah. given that. Well, mm -hmm. that, you know, that they trust you to know better than they do. Because you've been mm -hmm. this guy for 22 years. I haven't. You know, right. Does that work? Based on your experience of what you've seen him go through through, you know, the entirety of the show. Yeah. Um, it, it's just it, it's fascinating it's fascinating and I can't thank you enough for being on Chris hey it's my pleasure man thank you for having me always hey so we gotta talk we gotta finish up talk what you got going on this weekend yeah which uh, I was released this past August by the way I did react to this on the uh, LJ Peace Be Yacht, which is taped a month um, after its release to you all Again, we do yeah, I know you going to the Hill Country, right? Yep, the Hill Country, uh, New Braunfels, Hill County Comic Con. Uh, I'll be there with Mr. Josh Martin, our good friend Kara Edwards, who's been on the show with us, actually. Uh, yeah. Purple yeah, which I did react to video to that before. It's part of the video description that buys episode about the react, but go check it out. Continue on. Uh, I do believe they have... Uh, Oh, I think the voice of Scooby Doo is going to be there. Uh, wow, Frank Welker. If you watch this, uh, Frank, it's for you, buddy. Continue on. You remember the uh, the cute kid with the blonde spiky hair and glasses from Jerry Maguire? Yeah, oh yeah. I think he's going to be there. <laughs> uh, wow. I think they've got the uh, the actor who played the original Flash, and then in the current series, Flash's dad. And then Flash from an alternate universe Flash. Wow. Uh, so he, he'll be there. I think he's kind of the, the bigger headliner guy. Okay. And uh, a few others that are super fun. I can't think of right now at this moment. But. Okay. Uh, there's there's a, couple, a couple of Power Rangers. Johnny and Bosch will be there. So that's a bit. Oh, Power Rangers. Speaking of Power Rangers, a month after this release, I went to see um, James, James and David Frank in person, you know, at Planet Fun. If you watch Jason. For you, um, and um, it's great to see us. It's great to see you again. Great to see you in person for the first time in person. And um, yeah, I I met Tommy Oliver. It's the first time ever I saw Amos Doctor Will on Power Rangers Dial Finder. He was great. But um, yeah, continue on. Hold on, I can't hear a thing. Hmm. Hold on. There's, there's a couple a couple of Power Rangers. Johnny and Bosch will be there, so that's a big one. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. Is it fun for you to be hanging around those people and talking, talk a little show? Or do you get to? Are you just talking yeah, about Yeah, we get to time? here and there, you know. Sometimes you have to take the time to approach people and stuff. But, right. um, you know, at certain conventions, I always get happy when there's mm -hmm. someone there that I'm a fan of, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten to meet, like, half the cast of The Office, who I'm a huge fan oh, of. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I was a huge fan of The Office Bits and Pieces. The only thing about this meme I like, like, no, God, please, no. Well, it was very hilarious to watch, but, you know, that's just me. It was very hilarious to get up there and just make reaction videos about it, but, like, oh, my God. It was very fun. You know, if you ever saw my videos, you you know what I'm talking about. Continue on. He can talk with people like Will Wheaton, um, Anthony Michael Hall, who was really cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Josh and I sat down at lunch one day in back in the green room area and John Cusack and William Shatner sat down across from us. Well, you know, what like, is he up to these days? William Shatner. Hmm. Mm. Shatner. Hmm. I spell his last first name wrong. Oh, wow. If you watch this, uh, watch this uh, episode, I saw this episode of I saw this bit and piece of, um, yeah, I saw I keep repeating multiple times, but I did talk, saw the video on, on the interview on, was J David Hotnell, who was Mr. Speed Delivery, and he did talk about William Shatner, you know? He is 91 years old. 
And he's on Mr. Rogers one time. I'm like, okay. Makes more sense to me. Continue on. This is our live. This is our lives now. Wow. <laughs> Wait, it's we, got, it's... we do cool shit like this. <laughs> Your discretion is fine, ladies and gentlemen. Continue on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you know that's one of the the, the greatest lessons of this industry is you just you never know. Mm-hmm. You just never know yeah. where it's going to take you on this journey. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. I mean, I, I've met. Uh, lots of people uh, that I'm a fan of. Josh has a lot of fun because he's a big wrestling fan. We meet a lot of wrestlers on there. If you want to just bring Martin Jordan, though, for you guys, to see you on. We bring a lot of wrestlers out to these things. And so well, Josh is always slipping off and getting a picture with one of those oh, guys. But. I know. We did one with back in the Barney days. And I, I got to meet Batista. Oh, wow. And I, and this um, was before any of the sure. big acting things he was doing. Wow. But it was because of Josh. Right. And so Josh um, was like, hey, you got to go over. And I've got this great picture meeting him. And and then boom, look what happened there. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. Wait. Okay. All right. Now I'm on. See you on. Crazy. Are you saying that your meeting with Bautista is the reason his career launched and uh, went so high? Uh, that is not what I'm saying. <laughs> no, it's not. No, I'm saying. I'm saying. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I, I'll take whatever I can get there. Oh my God, Chris, I can't thank you enough. Hey man, I appreciate you. No problem at all. Hey, can can you leave with a little Mr. Satan? Uh, yeah, I can do a little to, to, to put you on the spot, Mr. Improvise. <clears throat> yeah, no problem. I always go with a good stock, Mr. Satan line. That he's pretty well known for, which is, uh, uh, well, I'm sick and tired of all these laxos tricks. If you want to fight the champ, you got to fight me, chump. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How can you not smile and enjoy that? <laughs> right? Oh, man. Well, thank you wow. so much, Chris. Jerry, it's been great, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Purple Road. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open when you find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week. So that was Purple Roads, episode number 77. Chris Rager, um, Mr. Satan of Dragon Ball Z. What do I think about this episode? It was amazing. So far, this episode went to be a success. Anyways, guys, that was my LJ. Peace be out. Episode number um, 813. Hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned for the next one. It's going to be... I was going to be episode number 814, which is going to be about um, Purple Rose episode number 78. Ralph Huston, of, who is a wardrobe designer of Barney and the Wiggles. Until next time, so Joe, goodbye, peace out, baby. We get more to be at this week, too. Until next time, out. See ya. Thank you.